Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Hubert, for the kind introduction. Uh, giving me way more credit uh, than I deserve across a number of fronts. But on an interesting side note, um, value charts was actually the indicator that Hubert and I originally met over, which is kind of fun. So I was, I've been enjoying seeing how he uses that with his own trading over the years, and uh, obviously we've we've expanded on that, and and uh, Hubert's become a very good friend of mine as well. So appreciate the opportunity to present and. Just to make sure that everybody can hear me okay. Uh, you're, by the way, you haven't missed anything yet. If you just if you just got here, this uh, this is going to be talking about value charts tonight. But just want to make sure everybody can see my screen okay. If you can see how we buy low and sell high, can you just put a S for screen? Just so I know. If you have difficulty seeing the screen, it should advance tonight. If you have difficulty, sometimes you have to reset your computer or possibly even log in, you know, log out, log back in. So strangely enough, a GoToWebinar has unusual effects on different computers, and so uh, it's hard to know exactly what to do, but that's what I'd recommend if you do not see my screen advance. Now, going to the next slide here, most of you are familiar with Hubert Centers. He is a, uh, a celebrity in the active trading world. He's been a self-made professional trader which are really, in my mind, the most interesting kinds of traders because they are usually people who have come up with the most innovative ways to trade the markets. And so uh, for those of you who know Hubert, you know that he does not beat around the bush. He's a straight shooter, and that's, uh, that's why we all love to hear what he has to say about the markets. Um, myself, I come from the hedge fund community or about, uh, for the past 20 years. After my first year as a mechanical engineering student in school, I left school for a period of about two years, moved up to Chicago, just walked into the Chicago Board of Trade at the age of 19, got a job down there, and worked for a number of years learning about the exchange and the, the pits. And then when I turned 21, leased a seat on the exchange for a few months and quickly realized that my true passion was working with the quantitative models and the very new science back then of trading platforms and quantitative financial models and indicators. So that was back when TradeStation was no longer or not around and it was System Writer Plus. So that was the Omega Research uh, platform. That was back when uh, Sam Tennis and Bill Cruz were meeting in a hotel room, I guess, to, to conceive of the idea of Omega Research. And Metastock was actually one of my first platforms as well back then in the late 80s. I was back when, when you downloaded the uh, your data every night. It would take like literally 20 minutes, it seemed like, to download 30 symbols with just the open, high, low, close, and volume. And then you would pray nobody would, uh, nobody would actually pick up the phone. And I'll have to turn off my phone and ringer here. So I apologize uh, here at my desk. So anyway, so that's enough about me. And i uh, excited to talk about value charts tonight. And... Uh, uh, get going. So I apologize. I'm taking my phone down here to make sure it doesn't ring anymore. Now, it's important to understand trading or investing carries a high level of risk. This is common sense, and but it does need to be said in our society. There's a lot of misconceptions about there out there about trading, but it's important to understand that if you trade, I highly recommend you only do it with what I call risk capital, money you can afford to lose, because the reality is most people lose when they trade. It takes them a while to learn how to successfully trade. And that only applies to the traders who stick with it long enough and actually end up turning the corner. So make sure that if you're trading, you trade money you can afford to lose. CFTC rule 4.41, make sure that you understand that hypothetical results, which we don't have any tonight, but understand hypothetical results have certain limitations and that even despite in the best circumstances that you cannot, it's not a map for the future. The hypothetical results do not guarantee Results, the same results going forward. So understand that. Now, let's talk about why we're here tonight. This is a question that I was struggling with when I first started looking into the markets back when I was a engineering student in college, and that is, if value is so important outside of the markets, why is it not just as important when trading stocks, options, futures, and Forex? Now, what do I mean by that? I'll show you. If you think about the way we buy real estate, we have a process of hiring an appraiser to come in and analyze comparable properties to determine a fair value estimate for either residential or commercial properties. That's, that's a key part of the whole process. Now, looking at the used car market, 
which is a free market compared to a new car market, we typically always reference a used car buyer's guide like the Kelly Blue Book or Edmunds. And the goal there is to try to find out what a year make and model automobile is worth. Because if we just walk up cold turkey and want to buy, for example, a 2009 Honda Accord, we have no idea in general. We're not experts at that asset, so we need help. And what these uh, these services do, either appraisers or the Kelly Blue Book, is they analyze what I call objective market valuation. It's what buyers actively involved in the markets and sellers actively involved in the markets are willing to pay or willing to sell for. So this is critical. This is very important information. Now, when we go over the stocks, bonds, futures, and forex, the financial markets, historically, when we think of value, we're thinking about subjective market valuation. Um, subjective market valuation relates to an opinion of an analyst. All right, it, it relates to the an analyst who nine times out of ten is not trading the market, and it's not a person who participates in that market most of the time. So it's nothing more than an opinion, and the opinion is only as good as the analyst is. So this. If you look at subjective valuations in the markets, they've been historically wildly inaccurate and typically, in my experience, not very helpful. So I do not look at subjective valuations in general or those opinions. I'm more interested in looking at objective market valuation, analyzing where buyers have paid and sellers have sold for because that is the most helpful, most powerful information to help us determine what an asset is worth. And my question back in college was, if we have the blue books, we have the appraisers, why in the world don't we have something like that for the stock market, for bonds, futures, for us, markets, etc.? So this all relates to being a speculator because as a speculator, our goal is to buy low and sell high. Now, that's been a, you know, a saying in Wall Street that has largely been uh, said tongue-in-cheek, and, and a lot of people have said that not believing that's even possible to do. But the reality is, is what they're really saying is it's not possible to identify undervalued and it's not possible to identify overvalued, right? So that's really what they're saying is when they say you can't buy low and sell high because nobody can define what that is. And historically, they've been right. There has been no universal standard definition of objective market valuation until now. Value charts is actually the first of its kind and an attempt to become like a super blue book for the markets. So let's take a look at A, what it is, and then B, how it can be such a powerful tool to help us enter markets strategically. And that's really what it's all about. Okay, what is strategic trade entry? Strategic trade entry I define as entering each trade with the goal of achieving unrealized profits as quickly as possible after trade inception. So that's our, our goal is when we buy into a market, we don't want to buy and all of a sudden have the market reverse down against us. This is what we don't want to have happen, where we buy at this level right here, all of a sudden prices start to taper off. We're not interested in doing that. If we do that, we're behind the eight ball right out of the gate, and then we're doing damage control from that point on. What we're interested in doing is timing our entry in the market so hopefully we can catch an undervalued point in time and then have the markets lift off from there and then experience a very low risk, high reward scenario. So that's what strategic trade entry is in my estimation. Learning strategic trade entry is perhaps the most powerful skill in trading. Now there's some debate about this. Certainly I acknowledge that exits are, more, are important as well, but in my opinion, entries are significantly more important than exits are. And the reason why is because if you enter a market right, then you have a lot of very attractive options at, uh, at, at your, your fingertips. So, for example here, if I enter a market and the wave goes up uh, right here, then and, and I get a degree of separation, let's say I enter this price level, then I have a lot of different very positive options available to me. I can take part of my profits. I can move my stop up to break even. Uh, I can I can hold on for a trend following trade, a longer term trade. I can hold on for a swing. I can exit part of my profits at a value target. So there's all sorts of very positive things. All of them involve profit, or or at least in the worst case scenario. And I say this knowing that there's no guarantee of this, but 
if we put a stop at break even, generally speaking, we're going to be executed at break even. Now, if you do it before an earnings report or a government report, you're playing, you're gambling essentially because we don't know what's going to happen with the market. It could have a shock and end up moving against us and, and blow through our stop. But day in and day out, this is a true statement. You can actually, if you catch the wave just right, buy undervalued, time your entry, it's possible to get in a situation where your worst case scenario is break even, all right, which is wonderful. That's why, in my opinion, the entry is by far the most important part of your trade. If you neglect the entry and then you're underwater with your trade, then, as I said before, the scenarios are a lot less attractive. You're looking essentially at doing damage control, and things are not nearly as attractive or, or positive as, uh, as if you know, compared to the time where you get in strategically and you're profitable out of the gate. So we're after the scenario where we achieve profitability as quickly as possible after trade inception. So once you are in the money with the trade, you are literally in the driver's seat, and that's what we're after here. Most people in the markets, and this includes some of the most sophisticated hedge fund managers in the world, they do not understand the power of the tools out there to get in markets strategically. You may be shocked. I, uh, having uh, been a speaker at Bloomberg events around the world, having met a lot of uh, the high-level hedge fund managers over in Hong Kong and Asia, New York, you name it, I can tell you most of them are not aware even that there are tools out there that can help, that can help not guarantee, but help hone timing down to a high precision. And that's what you're going to learn about tonight, one of the more powerful tools in my opinion. Now, all this has to do with the right tools. If I were buying a used car, the right tool for me would be the Kelly Blue Book or the Edmunds Guide because I want a fair value reference. Now, this tool we're going to present tonight and show you how this can help strategically called Value Charts, it is extremely powerful in working to uh, identify that, that entry level and define valuation. It's almost like a super blue book for the markets goes way beyond even the Kelly Blue Book does in the used car market. So the tools, I cannot emphasize this enough, tools make a huge difference. Not all indicators are alike. Some are far more useful than others. And this is after 20 years of being in a hedge fund, I can tell you I've looked at just about every indicator under the sun. Son, I can tell you that there are several indicators out there I would never trade without because they, they are more powerful. They're uh, much more effective in real time at communicating relevant market information and at the end of the day they help me with my trading so the three components of technical analysis can really be broken down as follows cost is communicated by a traditional price chart the price chart for example can be open high low close a line chart or candlestick chart to name a few now this is the most widely used market analysis tool in the world and this is it's something that I highly recommend everybody look at when they're analyzing trades. All right. The second one here is momentum. We need to understand market momentum, and that's the essentially the velocity of price. And this gives us an idea. This helps us time our entry level as well. Momentum can be a very, very powerful input. I always have a momentum indicator. Or I want to say always. That's uh, typically always reference a momentum indicator in my trading. Now, last but not least is value. All right, this is something newer in the markets. This has not been around over the past 100 years except for recently. And part of the reason why is because value is a fairly complicated calculation. Value is, is giving you insight into the psychology of a market and time frame. So if you're looking at a, the valuation, the objective valuation for a 60-minute chart on the S&P 500, what we're really interested in understanding is what do the active participants consider to be fair value? What do they consider to be overvalued? What do they consider to be undervalued? I mean, that's really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to understand. And in light of that, in light of other opinions we could have about a market, that becomes very relevant and very potentially powerful information. One well-known technical analyst said, value is the most important variable when describing a market. And I think he's right. I think value is critical. And I'll show you here in a minute how you can use it to, again, time your trades and identify these strategic entry points. <clears throat> Excuse me here. Okay, so traditional price charts display cost. So we understand that. Momentum indicators display momentum. Now, up until recently, we had nothing to show us value. Now, 
I understand there's indicators out there that are overbought, oversold. There's stochastic oscillators, RSI, uh, Bollinger Bands, and things like that. That's a little bit different. Now, they do they, these indicators do identify kind of extreme over overbots, extreme overvalues, or extreme undervalues, but they don't they don't distinguish one state of overvaluation versus another, and they certainly don't distinguish between overvalued and undervalued. They're just not designed to do that. They're good indicators. I use them myself, and uh, they can be extremely helpful and, and powerful. So, But just understand that they're not designed to be a Kelly Blue Book. They're not designed to be an objective value reference for a market. That's where value charts came in. So the challenge for me as an engineering student at school was to create a calculation that would analyze historical transactional price activity, what buyers have paid and what sellers have sold for, to gain insight into the psychology of what market participants consider to be fair value or overvalued or undervalued. Okay, that's what it really is boiled down to. Valuation is a, is a huge, uh, obviously, a component of the markets that relates directly to psychology of the markets. All right, and this can be a very powerful tool, again, in trading. So introducing value charts. Value charts are designed to communicate the objective valuation for any market and time frame combination. The, the words to focus on here are objective, not subjective, but objective, not my opinion, derived 100% from analyzing historical transactional price activity. Second is it's for a market applied to an individual market and for a particular time frame. This is important. I'll show you why this is important here in a second. But Valuation for one time frame in a given market can be different than for another time frame. This makes value more complicated, but it also makes valuation more powerful. So here are some keys you need to know about value when you look at trade. First of all, value is time dependent. What does that mean? It means it's possible for a market to be short term overvalued and long term undervalued. It's not a paradox. It means that the short term traders who may not even hold a trade overnight it's possible for a market to zip up in the morning, get overvalued intraday for these short-term traders, and then sell off into fair value on a very short-term perspective before the market close. Now, back up and look at a market from a much longer-term perspective, and that market could stay in a state of undervaluation for days or weeks. So that's the difference there. I and mean, each time frame has a unique valuation. Now, don't be intimidated by that because we can use that information as traders to give us a significant advantage in our trading. Okay, we'll come back to that here in a second. Value is best described as, excuse me, by mark, active market participants. So we don't, I don't care what an analyst thinks on Wall Street who doesn't even trade the market. I could care less. And that's not disrespecting these analysts. There's some very good ones out there. I, I recognize that. But I'm interested in knowing what the people think about the market who are trading it, who are buying and selling it on a frequent basis. Those are the ones, in my mind, who have the best input to describe valuation. Value is best described as a price continuum. Now, not to get advanced here with my verbiage, but a continuum is different than a specific price point. If you think about how our society has defined fair value, it's typically historically been a single price point. Like they'll say the fair value for a blue book in an automobile may be 15300 It's a specific price point. Our research, uh, my research especially with value charts, I believe shows that fair value is better described as a range. All right, So uh, it's, it's a range where the majority of buyers and sellers come in and agree to transact business. All right, not thinking it's a great deal, not thinking it's a bad deal. So it's a very acceptable range of prices to trade in. Now, you can, obviously, if you go near the bottom of the range, it becomes a little bit more undervalued. Near the top, becomes a little more overvalued. But essentially, we're looking for the lion's share of trading activity in a range we'll call fair value. And then you can have ranges for overvalued, and then you can have ranges for undervalued as well. So this creates a price continuum where you see trading activity continue to take place across every market and time frame combination out there. Fair value, again, is best described as a price range. Value is defined as time at price. What that means is, using an example from real estate, when I was in Florida, we saw the waterfront canal properties jump from maybe 150000 in the early 2000s to all the way up to like 400000 in just a matter of, of two to three years. I mean, just skyrocketed. 
So the people who were used to these canal front properties at 150,000, at first they were thinking, wow, 400,000, that's crazy, I'd never pay that. But the longer price stayed at those nosebleed levels, the more acceptance they gained. So what was once overvalued here at point number one became less overvalued over time at point number two and eventually became known as fair value. So 400,000 over time gained market acceptance and became known as fair value. Best of all, here's the best news of all time, value can be measured. So if you can think about pointing, if you had a little like an iPhone app, you could walk around and you were buying anything. You could point it at that and it would say the price of the asset you're looking to buy is overvalued. It would tell you exactly how overvalued it is. Or the price is undervalued, right? I mean, how powerful would that be if we had that? If you knew that a, a car was, the asking price was way too high, if the car was overvalued, you could either negotiate it way down or walk, not even waste your time looking at it. So that's the power we can derive from value now that we know that value can actually be measured. Now, if you want to know what a value chart looks like, let me say two couple things here. There's a couple ways to present value charts. Uh, this right here is using the bands. We're coloring the bands, leaving the chart bars neutral or black. That's one way to display a value chart's price window. Now, if you'll notice, this is a traditional you know, trend, uh, price bar chart up here. So this is an open, high, low, closed bar chart. Nothing special about that. Stated in units of dollars per share for the stock. Now, that, again, at the bottom here, this is called a value charts price window. Shares the same time axis as the chart on the top and has different units. These units over here on the right are called dynamic volatility units, and they're designed to expand with increasing market volatility and contract with decreasing market volatility. So here's the idea. If you see this line right here that I'm drawing, this red line, this is a, an example of a primitive definition of fair value. All it is is a simple moving average of median price. You see it kind of falling along here and lagging a little bit behind price, but if we took this red line and straightened it out down here and made it you know, go all the way across my zero line and my value charge price window, that's what that would represent. So the value charge price window is a linear representation of the oscillations of price bars around what we'll call a primitive definition of fair value. So what we're interested in understanding is when have things gotten kind of overvalued? When have they gotten overdone to the upside? When is it best advised for me not to be a buyer? Right? That's what we want to try to understand. When is it well advised for me not to be a seller because things are significantly undervalued? Or better yet, when can I time my entry to where I can, I can get in the market and try to achieve profitability as quickly as possible. This is all the questions that Value Charts is designed to help answer. Now, when you look at the organization, notice that Value Charts have three different colors. In the middle here, you'll see that we colored fair value green. So right in the middle here, this whole zone right here, and this represents plus one to plus, uh, minus one to plus one standard deviation. So approximately 68% of historical transactional price activity around the floating value axis, okay? You don't have to know anything about statistics. This is the only time I'm going I'm to throw this up there. You don't even need to care. I'm, I'm, it's like the, the mechanic telling you the fuel to air ratio for your engine. Hey, I just need to know where the accelerator is and where to put the gas in, and I'm fine. And you're probably the same way. So this is more for the theory. If you don't care about statistics, and don't worry about it. This is more for you, I should say, techies or nerds like me out there who want to know a little bit more about how we develop these uh, valuation zones. So plus one to plus two standard deviations is the yellow zone above the green zone. That's moderately overvalued. Plus two standard deviations and up is what we call significantly overvalued. All right, that's, that's when things have really gotten overdone. And you'll notice that represents historically less than 2-ish percent, 2.1 percent of the uh, transactional price data around the mean axis. So uh, on the downside, same type of deal. It's symmetrical. The yellow under the green is moderately undervalued. Minus 1 and minus 2 standard deviations and minus 2 standard deviations and below is red down here. So five valuation zones for those of you who just want to know how to use it. Five very easy to read valuation zones. And we have, depending on the platform, like Toss, Thinkorswim has these colored zones. Don't be intimidated by that. That's, this is actually my preferred way to, to display it. TradeStation actually colors the bars. So the bars are colored red or, or yellow or green, depending on where the bar segment is trading. But 
Um, and so just depending on the flexibility we have on the platforms is how we've designed the, uh, the value charts indicator. So just recognize that and understand that there's, this is the original classic value charts indicator with the bands right here. Uh, and just as effective in every way as the one that colors the price bars that I'll show you here in a minute on TradeStation. So five valuation zones, easy to understand, and updates in real time. Now, last here, lastly, I want to show you a tool that we designed to complement the value charts. Now, again, value charts have what we call dynamic volatility units, expanding with increasing volatility and uh, contracting with decreasing volatility. Okay, so... Uh, and understand that. Now over here on the right hand side we see a tool called price action profile and all that is is let's say I took all these price bars here on the value charts price window and stacked them all up like moved them all the way over to the left hand side of my screen I would get this bell curve looking shape and that's exactly what I have here with the price action profile and why this is powerful is because if you'll notice I can now calculate the degree that a market is overvalued or undervalued by looking at the percentage of historical transactional activity at or above or at or below a certain level. So in this example, we see we're trading at the upper end of fair value. Historically, we've traded 27.7% of the time above that and 72% of the time below that. Now where this becomes very interesting and very helpful is you'll notice right here at this over eight reading in the price action profile statistics table, it says 1.6%. So that means that this market and time frame combination only trade in the upper red zone less than 1.6% of the time. Now that should tell you something. So if you're up in that area, it's nosebleed area. In fact, it's interesting today, I was looking at the Russell 2000 futures and it, it when it was testing significantly overvalued, it was just nailing it today. Maybe you sold that, uh, I think I was using 250 tick bars, it was just like clockwork, time to sell. And it usually sold off a couple points. Same thing on the downside here, if I want to say what, how, what percentage of price activity takes place under the negative five or including the bottom yellow and the bottom red, over here on my table it shows that 8.7% of price activity is usually under five. And I'm sure that's actually not, that's only uh, the bottom half of this yellow zone, not, not the top. So uh, it's part of the yellow zone and below. So just understand that. So these the statistics help us understand how the degree that a market can be overvalued or undervalued but once you kind of get a head knowledge for this, all you really need is the value charts price window in general. But uh, so that's really what we're here to look at. The value charts price window is what we use to identify trading opportunities. Now, one thing I wanted to show you here, this is actually an indicator I'm showing you that doesn't even exist. This is for demonstration purposes only. You'll notice that if I actually state the value charts units in stated in terms of the actual uh, index units up here looking at the S&P 500 futures, look at how this ex contracts in some areas with lower volatility prices and then expands dramatically as volatility picks up. That's the secret ingredient of value charts and that's what allows it to be effective in defining overvalued or undervalued price levels in real time. So value charts is has to be dynamic. It has to adapt to changing market conditions and changing market volatility. If it didn't do that, it, we couldn't effectively uh, identify levels that we call overvalued or undervalued by a certain degree. Here's another example using a copper bull market. You can see how early on, low volatility, you know, not a lot of prices were contracting, and the value, uh, dynamic volatility units were contracting as well. Once we really picked up here into the peak crescendo area of the bull market, you started to see the volatility units really start to come alive and become extraordinarily volatile. So that's, uh, again, the secret ingredient that allows value charts to work in both low volatility and high volatility conditions. This is a quick little glance at how the windows are laid out in the, on the Bloomberg platform. This is what we call master value charts window. And again, your one up here is traditional price chart. Directly below that, our value charts price window is the position I typically keep it myself on my screen. And then over here to the right-hand side, you see the price action profile window again. And then on the bottom here, you see the uh, what we call the status bar. So this is just to give you an idea of one configuration. The most important thing here, obviously, is number one, our traditional price chart, and number two, our value charts price window. Those are the ones we need to make the strong trading decisions and identify the strategic entry points. Now value charts validation. One question I think anybody would ask is, okay, um, 
how do I know this work? I mean, Mark, you say this is a, a model that's designed to uh, define objective market valuation for any market and time frame combination. How do, how do I know that the formula actually works over time? All right, now before I tell you this, understand that just because a market is overvalued does not necessarily mean it's a good sell. Okay, because the prices can be doing one of two things. It can either be going through what we call value migration or a trend, or it can be a value reversion, which is usually the case, where prices get overvalued all day long in what we'll call um, the centralized markets with price discovery, always looking or seeking out fair value and oscillating between overvalued, undervalued, and fair value uh, constantly. So that's what we're up against in the we'll call exchange traded or centralized markets. And as going into this, understand the validation is looking for a consistent ability for value charts to effectively define valuation in dramatically changing market conditions. So here's what we did. We went out and found three extremely bright PhDs in statistics, one from University of Michigan, one from UCLA, and one from University of Pennsylvania Wharton, so Ivy League as well. And we said, here's our formula, guard it with your life, and by the way, go out and tell me if, if this actually works. And so the first test they did was look at the S&P 500 over three decades. And the reason why is because this increases, the volatility of this market increases by 450% over the 80s versus the 90s and 2000s. Dr. Eric Labor from the University of Michigan came back and said, value charts demonstrate a remarkable ability to define market valuation through dramatically different volatility conditions contained in 30 years of S&P 500 market data. So uh, came back, two thumbs up, was effective in doing what we wanted it to do. Now, the second phase of this test, this first phase was using what they call box plots and looking at the ability for dynamic volatility units to adapt to changing volatility. Second test was comparing the price action profiles or distributions. Again, this is all statistical mumbo jumbo that most of us don't need to worry about. But um, this just takes the three decades and compare them compares these to each other, and what we're looking for is a 45-degree relationship, and essentially I'm, I'm brutalizing this, drawing this by hand, but that's what we saw, and they came back with the second round of testing and said, the QQ plot clearly shows the price action profile from the three different decades in the S&P 500 to be remarkably similar, which indicates that value charts were highly effective in defining market valuation despite dramatically changing market volatility conditions. All right, so now we've gone over some of the theory. Let's get over to the trading and start talking about that. Trade examples are favorite stuff. Now, here's what value charts is capable of doing. Okay, uh, can everybody see live charts, by the way? Hopefully everybody can see my chart here of, of, of TradeStation. Just to verify that this is advancing okay, just a simple yes would be great. Excellent. Uh, Al, you should see it, hopefully, by now. Now, this is what this is a, an example of the power of value charts. Okay, now let me let me just say this first of all. This is not the holy grail because there's no such thing. Okay, there's no indicator that's going to be right all the time and wrong or you know right all the time and make money guaranteed every time. I will say this though. I believe that value charts is one of the most powerful indicators on the markets and can be extremely powerful in strategic trade entry. Here's an example of that. Now, the recent high we had last month in the stock market happened on March 7th, okay, right here. And the secondary high we had happened on March 21st. Now, I actually called both of those highs, okay? Great, Mark, good for you. You know, that's, that's great information. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is not to, to, not to impress you with me, is to communicate the fact that when you understand how to use value, momentum, and price together, you have the tools to potentially nail tops and bottoms, all right? So not only did I call out the tops in these markets, okay, I called them out to the hour. So I, on, the, on March 7th, I nailed the top of the stock market down to the very hour, and on March 21st, I did the same thing again, down to the hour with this correction, all right? Let me show you how I did that. Now, here's how you know I did it. Okay, here's a zoom in, by the way, of, of those two tops. So not only the days, we drilled down and nailed the tops down to the very hour. All right, I challenge you to find people or more people who have been able to do that. Again, it's not me. It's just understanding how to use objective valuation with momentum and with price. There's traders out there who are a lot better than I am. Okay, I, 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 but these tools can help even a, you know, a person like me 
who, who uh, you know, I, I need the guidance, so I like to have that. Now, this is a trade alert that I sent out with our ValueCharts.com service to our members, and it says stocks look like a potential short-term or long-term top. This was sent out on the very hour that stocks topped out, S&P 500 topped out here in uh, on March 7th. And here's what I was looking at. It was in a channel, all right? The, the value charts popped up here and broke the channel, went significantly overvalued. I'm going to show you a live chart here in a second. And then failed, and it came back down. And I was also bearish from a monthly standpoint. So I thought, I thought the weeklies, I'm sorry, weeklies look bearish. And then this, in, uh, this failure to break the top of the channel combined with significantly overvalued and then falling momentum. See how momentum line is falling here and weakening from point one down here to point two. So we have a higher high, I'm sorry, this is one, we have a higher high and we have lower momentum here when the market just peaks out up here at point two. So bearish divergence, a, a channel, failure breakout, significantly overvalued, I combined all those. Confluence is the most powerful tool to accomplish what we're talking about here today. So I said stocks look like a potential top after the unemployment this morning. I am short the NASDAQ futures. So let's take a look at the NASDAQ real charts here and I'll show you uh, what I was looking at. So can everybody see my NASDAQ chart here? Hopefully they can. This is a 120 minute. You'll see a red arrow down here. This is my trade station. Now I chose to trade the NASDAQ because the NASDAQ seemed a lot weaker than the S&P 500. It just seemed vulnerable to downside a lot more than the S&P was. But frankly, all the stock indices tend to follow each other anyway. So notice the between point one, I'll put a down hour here, Point one right here, and then point two, we have greatly weaker momentum. So momentum has really fallen off here and uh, coming down. So and notice also we poked up the new highs briefly at, at the top. I'll put a red arrow underneath there. Okay. Uh, let me make that non-snap mode. I, I would put it up top, but it's going to get off the screen if I do that. So right underneath this price bar. And then notice on our value charts price window down here that there's a red arrow right at the top here. We poked up into significantly overvalued. We know the markets trade at that nosebleed level on 120 minute bars less than 2% of the time. So that's getting up there. And then combined with everything else I was looking at, new highs, bearish divergence, channel breakout failure in S&P, all this together spelled trouble for the stock market. And that's when I published a trade alert. All right, so that's what I'm looking at. You can use these tools. These tools do require a level of skill. All right, if you want to learn how to read the markets, read the psychology of the markets, value charts is a very powerful tool, but you need to commit the time to really understanding how it interacts with momentum, how it interacts with price, support, and resistance levels. And it can be extremely powerful. And by the way, I'll take questions here just in a minute. Let me go on to the second example here of the trade on the 21st. So next chart example was looking at a broadcast, another trade alert that I sent out saying, hey, uh, S&P 500 is bearish right now. This is using a what we call a value candle pattern, so value charts candles, all right, which are very powerful. Now, this is not a candlestick chart you see right here. This is called value bars, but notice right here that we have a doji that has a yellow hat on it or the yellow top tip on there. We call that a yellow hat doji. It's bearish. So I broadcasted a sell setup. I went short myself, and we had a couple of our members go short as well. And you'll notice what happened right after this. So this is on the 21st. We saw prices really get hit. So let me let me pull up the um, S&P chart. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see uh, uh, see this. Uh, let's see here. Slide did not move. Can everybody see the slide now? Let me let me go back and just show you this again. For those of you who didn't see this, just like. Okay. So this was the slide. I apologize if you didn't see that. So hopefully everybody can see that. Can everybody see the? Uh, the, the signal feed viewer slide here. It's pretty quick. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go back over to trade station. Now, the red arrow up here on the top is where that was broadcasted. At the, at the completion of that price bar, prices got hammered after that. So a, a, a value candlestick can be very powerful. And again, we saw a falling momentum histogram and we saw the value candle forming down here on the value charts indicator. So again, it's, it's, you look at this stuff and say, Mark, I don't see this as being really obvious. It's not going to be obvious until you learn the nuances. Learn it. And it's not that hard to learn, really. It's, it's one of those things where if you put the time in uh, and, and understand it, we've got uh, education and training available as well. And Hubert's going to show you some ways he uses this to trade. But put the time in, study it, and you can see how 
value and price and momentum all really interact and it's amazing how if you have these three things going on and you can use other things uh, you know other powerful indicators like uh, uh, Hubert's a big fan of Ichimoku charts um, you know or candlestick charts uh, I enjoy other indicators as well if you combine all these things with geometric chart patterns and things like that you're gonna find that trades start jumping out at you and you're gonna find that that you're gonna see unusual opportunities if you're patient that represent excellent reward to risk ratios in trading. All right. In fact, let me show you a quick example here before I hand off to Hubert of, of what happened today. We had a really nice one start to develop on the soybeans market. So soybeans were, let's see here, if we can actually get that to, okay. Uh, trade station sometimes doesn't like to play nice. Let's see if we can actually get that to update. Okay, I'm going to try, let me see if I can go with my, first of all, my daily, see if that actually updates. Okay, I'll right, we'll go up here. Excuse my trade station. It uh, sometimes can be a little temperamental. So let's try pulling up a daily soybeans chart here. Okay, so what I was looking at here was I was looking at the fact that uh, momentum was dying off a little bit. We're getting new highs in the soybean market. And if you extend a trend line here, you know, it starts going up to, you know, close to where prices hit topped out in today's price bar. So I'm, I'm on daily. Let me drill down to like the, the, the 120s. So this is what I was looking at this morning. I sold beans earlier this morning. You'll notice right here we had that same yellow hat doji, right? But that's that, that showed up in the 60s, but where that really showed up was the 240s. This is what was compelling for me. So let me format a symbol, 240 minute here. Uh, in here, and it had two. It had a golden doji, and then it had a yellow hat doji right in a row. You see these right here. So when I sell those two dojis right in a row, the golden doji is bearish, the yellow hat doji is bearish as well. It got hammered, and so right after these two bars were formed, I sold beans, and literally the most I was ever underwater, I think, was twenty-five dollars a contract. So easy money. I mean, and the great thing about these indicators is when you have two value candle patterns right in a row. Let me throw up uh, let me throw up the value charts price window as well so you can see that on the bottom. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to make that five. I like to use the five, 10, and 14 look back periods. But right here, you'll notice in the end on my value charts price window, I've got value bars up here as well. The value charts price window is showing me, again, a golden doji. It's all yellow. And then the yellow hat doji right in the row. And notice we have declining momentum on the histogram here as well. So that was a beautiful setup, and typically the way you trade this is once these two are complete or once one of them even is complete and you're bearish, you have a trend line up here. It's resistance. Um, you have, in fact, let me see if I can draw that a little better. So you have that resistance there, and then you have also the two value candles, which are bearish. And the dojis are not bearish by themselves, but when you combine them with overvalued, moderately overvalued prices, they become bearish and become excellent turning point. Uh, indicators. So these are great. We uh, I use these all the time, value candles, and, and this was actually a live trading example of, of uh, what we found today. Let me show you one other one real quick that we saw yesterday. Uh, I say that maybe it was, um, might have been Monday. Actually, let me uh, format this. This was actually on the 240-minute coffee chart. Uh, this works on stocks, by the way. Great on stocks, great on other markets as well. Now look at coffee. You'll notice that over here, the momentum is starting to die off here with each upward swing in the market. And right here, you'll notice that we have a moderately overvalued price point, and you'll notice that your, your histogram on your momentum is actually red. It never turns green. So go back down to your value charts price window here at the bottom. You have a yellow portion, moderately overvalued. We know it only trades in that region, typically 16% of the time or less at, at or above that. So it's pretty overvalued. We have dying momentum. And we sold coffee, and it was just easy money. I mean, just uh, sold off. Now, in fairness, I, I have a lot of losing trades as well. So I'm not here to tell you that it's all, it's all uh, roses because it's not. Okay. However, I will tell you that it becomes extraordinarily powerful. Here's another great setup right here. This is called the no return. See the very high of coffee right there? It has a yellow tip. Notice on your value charts price window down here on your 240s. But notice what's happening with your momentum. Do you see how your momentum histogram is still red? So it's not even strong enough upswing to turn it green. This is what we call a no return setup. Very powerful. And that was the exact top. If you sold it there, you're literally 
selling it like around 211.50. The high was at 212.05. So 50 ticks off the high, and it ends up selling off literally 40 points. So I mean, you find indicators out there. If you can find indicators out there that can that have the potential to enter markets with that kind of precision, email me because I want to know about them. But in my own personal experience, after working with hedge funds for 20 years, this combination right here, value, price, and momentum, together with other things you can use too, like Ichimoku or things like that, are extremely powerful. All right, so that that's it for the nutshell from my uh, presentation here. But if you you know just understanding, there's new indicators out there. They're powerful. They've been validated, and they represent an edge. Value charts gives me an edge every day. I see things in the markets with value charts that professional hedge fund managers you manage, you know, billion dollar funds don't see because they don't have it. It's just if you, if I don't have my value charts up, I have no idea if a market's moderately overvalued or fair value or significantly overvalued. Okay. Uh, RSI, stochastics, and those indicators, great indicators. I, I love to use them as well at certain times. They just don't communicate that. They don't communicate the various degrees of overvaluation, and, and they don't have that the high precision capability necessarily in the same way that value charts have. And I see those indicators like RSI and stochastic oscillator and Bollinger Bands as actually being highly complementary. So I want a trader, a traders expo recently, and I were, were going over Bollinger Bands and value charts. And we actually identified a really cool trading strategy using both of them together. When they both lined up and they both reached extremes, then more often than not, it was a great time to buy or sell. All right. Well, you've listened to me talk long enough. I don't want to keep from uh, keep Hubert from presenting because he's got some great stuff to talk about too. But I appreciate your uh, you know your coming tonight and hearing me out on this. If you have any questions, uh, we're always here to help at valuecharts.com. And uh, support at valuecharts.com uh, is uh, always available. We I think we're out tomorrow. Our support uh, is out tomorrow with Good Friday. But most weekdays, we're always there to, to help out. So, Hubert, if you want to take it away, we're excited to see how you trade value charts. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, sir. All right, so I'm going to grab the screen here. Let me know when you guys can see my screen number six. You should, it should say, what does it work on? Does everybody see that? Yes, C. I got a lot of C's and yeses. All right. So the indicator works on TradeStation, TOS, which is also known as Thinkorswim, which is also known, a.k.a., as Ameritrade. It works on eSignal, Sierra Charts, Ninja, Metastock, and I believe you – oh, Ninja too. Now, I want to show you what it looks like on TOS. This is a snapshot. I had uh, Jared right behind me. I said, hey, man, grab me a snapshot of what it looks like on TOS. This is a snapshot of the 30-year bond on a daily chart, and as you can see, looks a little bit different than the picture that you see in TradeStation. Do not let that intimidate you at all. It's not a big deal. All it means is you want to you want to play in the red. You want to you want to what you want to do is you want to dabble in the yellow and play in the red. And by dabble, I mean it's going to hit the yellow more times than it is the red. But notice here in the red where it was a statistically over bot situation here in the bonds, which rallied right here into this area, that is a sell signal. It's statistically overbought. Does that make sense? Now down here you can see here was a, sig a statistically oversold situation right in, I'm trying to line it up, I think it's right in here. So yeah, and you can see it bounced really good, right? That's got Ichimoku on top of it. That's just part of an indicator that I like. But do you notice uh, how, all right, so that's what it looks like on TOS. I'll show you what it looks like on TradeStation in just a second. This just makes it easier, and every charting platform or vendor that we use gives us different display inputs that we can mess with. So not all the time will they look the same, but the numbers will match up really, really closely. So that's really all you need to be worried about. All right, so that's what it looks like on TOS. Um, let's see. Next slide would be it comes with a multi-platform license, which really what that means is you can use it and install it on more than one chart vendor for one low for one low price. So if you've got a TradeStation account and a TOS account and a Ninja account, well you can put it on all three. You can put it on the eSignal too. All for one low price. You don't have to, you know, buy it every time you want to put it on a platform. So that's really cool. And it also comes with a multi PC license. You can put this up onto at least three PCs. All right. Three PCs that you own. Don't be sharing it with your buddy, right? That's not cool. You can put it on your work PC, your home PC, or a laptop PC. All right. 
Now, here's the deal for the indicator, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, after I give you the special offer, I'm going to go into live charts and show you how I use it, and then I'll have a link above my chart so you can do that. So it's uh, HTTP colon, you know, valuecharts.com forward slash chart. Now, before you click there, I want to show you one thing. Now, over at Value Charts, this indicator usually comes in a package that is valued at $997. I just want to be crystal clear, you are not getting all of those. You are getting this top one. You see this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is a great way for you to learn how to use their, their flagship indicator without having to pay $997. So I talked to Drew and Mark into it and said, you know what, you might want to break that out. That's a really good that's a really good indicator that you guys can build your whole, you know, welcome match strategy through. And a lot of people can learn about and that's how I came to know them was through value charts. So it's normally in a package that sells for nine hundred and ninety seven dollars. You're gonna get the one indicator, which is value chart. The value chart indicator. Go to valuechart.com. You can also call the office. Uh, operators are standing by and you can call area code eight five nine nine six three three four four five. I'm going to give you the link right here, and then I'm going to show you what it looks like on all my charts, and I'm going to show you some strategies of how I use it. For the first 50 folks, it's only $97. $97, one-time fee, no recurring fee. It's just a one-time fee. Um, last but not least, you have absolutely zero risk. It comes with a 30-day money-back, 100% satisfaction guarantee, no questions asked. If you don't love it, if you don't think you like it at all, if you just don't like Mark's accent or my accent, we'll give you we'll give you your money back. All right? uh, we always over deliver, and our goal is to make sure that you always have ten times the value that you invest in any of the stuff that you purchase from us. So here's the link one more time: valuecharts.com forward slash chart. The special is four ninety seven dollars for the first fifty people. Area code eight five nine nine six three. Three, four, four, five. So let's take a look at my trade station. All right? Now, can everybody see the, the, the link up above here where it says valuechart.com forward slash chart and the telephone number? When you're ready to order, use that link, type it into your browser, or call that telephone number. All right. Can the indicator be used on intraday charts? Sure. Right here it is on a 10-minute chart. So here's what I do. So no, no, no secret, I trade a lot of bonds, right? So I've been long bonds. Today I got stopped out of a trailing stop where I locked in $1,300 on a bond trade, okay? Now, notice here I've got a sell signal on, I'm going to move this because this is going to confuse you. I'm going to move this to this. So on Ichimoku, I've got a sell-off. I've, a, a, uh, I've got a candlestick signal here. You see here on the yellow where I went below, the candlestick went below the yellow line. Well, now I'm going to go to the purple, which is 133.16. So in other words, I now have bonds shifting from the long side to the short side, okay? So what I'll do is I'll then look at the bonds on, say, something like a 10-minute chart, and now you can see if, if I've got bonds as pegged as going slightly lower, then what do, how, I, how do I want to sh short those? I lost a lot of cash in bonds today. Gail, that's terrible. You shouldn't have lost a lot of cash. You should only just use a very small amount of cash on bonds. Just use really, really tight stop losses and, and make sure that you're, you're always on the right direction. Yeah. So yeah, you, I mean, if you give if you give a little bit back, that's not a big deal. I mean, we've made so much money in bonds. Now you're going to start giving a little bit of it back. Uh, so here we go. So if you go into the strategy of I think bonds are now headed lower. Do you see this little red tip right here? You see this? Can everybody see this on my chart? I'm going to zoom it in so you can see it. I'm just making it. See the little red tip? So this tells me that, all right, if you think bonds are going lower, right there is a sell signal on bonds right there. Now, it's also, oddly enough, an eight-tick pullback. So it's a perfect little trade to do, right? So I'm actually in that trade. So, I mean, I put my money where my, math is, my mouth is, probably not in the high 90% percentage of the time. So you can see that's a sell signal. I shorted it here. I'm using a five-tick stop loss, and I'm willing to risk $156.00. To make a thousand, and to be honest with you, I'm probably looking more at two thousand dollars on the target on this thing. Markets are closed right now. I have to reset it. All right, so that's how I look at it. Do you think bonds are going to go lower? I do think they're going to go a little bit lower, yeah, because of they are below the yellow. They're probably going to go to the purple. Now let's take a look at something else. Let's take a look at say 
Uh, any any other symbols you guys want me to take a look at? I want to make sure that I don't cherry pick them. You throw them up, and I'll take a look at them really quick, and I'll show you where they're going. Uh, do you have smart money index for Meta stock, uh, Henry? I don't know. Based on value charts, would you kindly go over the current position on the ES and CL? All right, so I would go like this. I'd go at ES, and I would say, okay, ES is above the cloud. It's above the yellow and the purple. So the ES would probably be to the high side, right? So let's go right here. At ES, boom. So since ES closed above 1847, that's going to be a decent long. So what you want to do is you find your time frame. Now, in this case scenario, you're just going to have to dabble. All right. You see the yellow. The yellow are going to be the statistic or the the moderately oversold. Moderately oversold. Moderately oversold. All right. So then you'd buy those yellows. Now for me, I try to stay away from the yellows. I really like the reds way better than I like the yellows. So if you had the the market going up or down, then what I would like to see is I'd like to see right here. If we get a, a red tip to the downside, you could purchase some on on the ES. I'll take a look at crude oil too. At CL, let me first take a look at a daily here on CL. At CL, on the daily, the daily looks good. I wouldn't pr uh, personally touch uh, crude until it gets above 104.50, but it still looks like it's in a valid uptrend, right? So let's say if you wanted to mess with crude oil, you would have bought it. I'll put lines here so you know where to buy it. You would have you would have bought it there and there, and you would have bought it here, and you would have bought it here, and then you would have bought it right there. Though, So there's the three longs today in crude oil, long, long, and long. So not bad, right? Uh, Goldman Sachs, let's take a look at Goldman Sachs. So the first thing that I do is I qualify the trend. Does that make sense? I qualify which way I think the pressure is going, and then all you have to remember is, is if you think the thing is in an uptrend, then you're going to buy when you get these red tips at the bottom. If you think it's in a valid downtrend, then you're going to short when you get these red tips to the high. It's a great way to do it. Great way. And if anybody in here has ever been burnt with MACD, Stochastic, RSI, this is a way better way of doing things. All right, what's the next one you want me to take a look at? Goldman Sachs. Uh, GS for Goldman Sachs. Let's take a look here in Goldman Sachs. So Goldman Sachs is obviously in a massive downtrend. So I would short it at any opportunity because the daily on Goldman Sachs is a short. Specifically at 161.45, that's a good short. What did the 10-minute tell us to do today? Huh. I'll be back on. Look at there. The 10-minute said right here, short me. So decent signal, right? Good little signal. Nice, nice trade. AAPL. Apple's a little bit of an odd character right now because Apple is it's, it's a short signal. But it's trying to develop. It, Apple's kind of trading sideways. So until Apple gets out of its sideways funk, I personally would not trade it because it's, it's, it's a little weird here. It's, it's below the cloud, but it's trying to cross back up above. So just be careful with Apple. There's not a real great read on Apple. Uh, SN, SNDSK, what is that? How about Facebook? Is that a symbol? That's a lot of symbols. It's a lot of letters. So Facebook, is, it would, Facebook would be an aggressive sell, an aggressive sell because it's below the cloud, but the lagging line's not below the cloud. So you could do both ways. You could either go long or short on Facebook because it's it, it would be an aggressive sell. But here's where you would short it at. Facebook's a short right there, and it looks like it wants to go a little bit lower. Twitter, T, W, T, R. I can hear the phone ringing off the hook on the background. Thanks, guys. Twitter is a massive short. So here are your sell signals on Twitter. I'll mark them for you. You can see you'd, you would sell here here and here not bad signals Twitter's probably gonna bounce just a smidge higher but it looks great on the sell signals for going lower do you check fundamentals I can't even I can I can't George I can't even say fundamentals sorry uh, G O O G L versus G O O G <laughs> what, what, what is that there you go S S N D K there you go S N D K that makes sense. You take a look at that on the daily. That's in a valid uptrend. So today, you should have bought it right at the close of today. Now, this is a huge gap up, so you have to be careful because any indicator gaps will mess with it. But it was still in a massive uptrend. So let's see how it fared before you had that massive gap up situation, right? So massive up right here. You could have bought it right here. 
You could have bought it right here. You could have bought it right here. It, it works pretty good on SanDisk. Uh, so basically, you just get a feel for whichever way bullish or bearish, then you use the red value to buy and sell. Yes. I don't get a feel, though. I, I let my Ichimoku tell me which way is bullish or bearish. It's pretty simple. Like, if it's above the cloud, if it's above the, the yellow and the purple lines, it's, it's probably going up. Yeah. Google Class A shares versus Google Class C's, one up today, other one down. Yeah. Um, I haven't quoted those. G-O-O-G-L. Here's the Class A shares. That's a short. I would short Google right here. was a perfect short signal on Google today right there. Bing! Right there. That's a sweet little signal. You can see it's been in the sell signal for a few days. You also had a sell signal yesterday. At the oh day before yesterday, look at that. You had a sell signal right here at the end of the day. Look at that, and then it sold off like crazy. And then you had one at the beginning of the day. It, it trades Google pretty well. A P O L A P O L. A P O L is a massive downtrend, so I would like to short it. Now look, you do have a a a doji bounce here, so it's probably going to bounce to about twenty nine eighteen when it starts bouncing. It likes to bounce to the yellow and the purple. It's still a downtrend, so what I would do on this is I would wait until it got up in this direction here to short it. So if you've got a scaling methodology, what you can do is you could short it at the opening of the day, but I'd like to wait to short it at 29.18. Do you know if the trade station radar screen can scan for potential trades with your value charts price sector profiles? I don't know if it does or not, Dan, to tell you the truth. Does value charts work on a three to five minute chart? Watch this right here. Here's a three minute chart of Apollo. Boom. Yes, it works just fine. It works on time and tick charts just fine. No worries whatsoever. Very fast. Doesn't bog down your machine. It's good to go. So to order it, go to valuecharts.com forward slash chart. P-A-C-W. P-A-C-W. I haven't used it on range charts, so I couldn't tell you, Susan. Uh, this would be a short. Let me change it back to a 10 minute. That's my default time frame. I like to mess with things. Uh, had a short right at the top of the day and the top of yesterday. It works really good on PACW. Does it work on FX? Sure it does. Let's go at Japanese Yen. Japanese Yen looks, there you go. Let's go at British Pound. The British Pound is obviously in a new valid uptrend, so we would only want to buy uh, pullbacks on this. So we would buy a pullback here, 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 and here. So yes, it works on Forex just as well. Uh, can you check ULTA? ULTA. ULTA is it's a short, but it's it's an aggressive short to the downside. In other words, it's too early. But I would short the red tips on Ulta. And it looks good. It looks like it's really doing well with Ulta. Boom, boom, boom. It's catching a lot of the tops on it. GBP. CHF. Nice. Let's take a look. Um, on the daily here, see that's a mess. There's no advantage there. It's try it's an aggressive long because it hasn't cleared yet, but it's looking like it. And then so you'd have to get long down here on this red right here, right there, and then right there. Decent job. SPY, yeah, it works fine. SPY. SPY is a long, it's above the yellow and the purple. So you'd buy all the red tips to the downside to add into your position. I have gone home with a full point stop loss in the bonds, but they are still above the cloud. Do I have a chance to improve this position? We mean improve the position. I have gone home with a full point loss in the bonds. So you should never take a full point loss in the bonds ever, Gail. Loss, not stop, no. So why are you not using stops? Because you hate money. Always use a stop on anything that you trade. You always use a stop. And if you don't know how to use a stop, just don't trade. Always make sure you use a stop loss. If you're already down a grand on it, uh, I didn't know my cat had stepped. Oh, your cat has stepped on the bar. Oh my God, that's terrible. I, here's what. I, here's the best advice I would give you, Gail. I would say, let me look at it really quickly for you. At US. I would, the 10 minutes bounce a little bit. You might get to 134.9. Let me look at the trade tab real quick. 
I would. Here's what I would do. First, kill the cat. Right. That's the first thing. You you have to sacrifice the cat. You have to kill it. Um, uh, I'm just joking. I like cats. They're fine. But I would just close the position out. What usually happens when you try to fix a position that either was a trade error or an accident, and you try to fix it and try to get out of it, it almost never works. So what you're better off doing is just pulling the Band-Aid off and going, ah, there went $1,000, and then just start fresh. Because right now it's causing you too much mental anguish and stuff, and it's probably freaking you out a little bit. So I just I would just be done with it. That's what I'd do. That would be my advice. It's tough, though. Uh, first thing Monday? No, you, you do it now. <laughs> you do it right now. Not first thing Monday. Do it right now. Just get out of it. Yeah, because the market's still open. Oh, aren't they close? Oh, God. I tried because today is Friday. Oh, mm, I totally forgot about that. Yeah, you're, you're host. Um, yeah, you could be host. I forgot about that because tomorrow is closed. And they closed that, so they won't ba open back up. So, yeah, you might be a little bit host. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. I will be pulling for you, though. Uh, if you go to Value Charts website and buy the indicator, there's an option for Value Charts Core Bundle. Would it be possible to see what the other indicators are before making the decision? I really don't have the money to buy something I cannot use. Um, I, uh, Harvey, you can call the office. There are a bunch of different ways to look at value charts. There's a bunch of different other platform ways to look at it. You're talking about this right here. The value chart plus the profile, the scanner, the flags, signal bars, value bars, alerts, and levels. It's a bunch of different other ways to look at value charts is what it is. Uh, value bars puts the color on the bars. Value alerts sends you alerts. Value levels puts lines across the bars. The scanner scans for it, and the price action profile Mark showed you. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I forgot all about Easter. Yeah, so. Uh, well, yeah, first thing Sunday. And, you know, if it bounces on Sunday, you can get out of it maybe with your skin intact. We'll see how it goes. So, yeah. All right, here is your offer once again. Is valuecharts.com forward slash chart. Value chart indicator, $97 for the first 50 people that order. Air code 859-963-3445. Uh, what is value charts plus, please? I would have to show you. and I don't know if I've got it on my charts. I think I do, but uh, it, I'd be better off having Mark show you. I bought these and your bond trade. Oh, very nice. Very nice, Gail. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for you. I hope, I, hope you didn't, I hope you don't get hurt more this weekend. I really do. And sorry about your cat jumping on your keyboard. That's terrible. Uh, can you make these recordings available? I, we will do our best. Yeah, I don't know why everyone keeps saying Happy Easter. It's not supposed to be a happy holiday. <laughs> that's, that's funny but sad at the same time. Which indicators are red arrows at the top of the chart? That's not an indicator. Mark, All, all Mark did is he went like this. He went, okay. So this, when you look at that, who asked that question? So, oh, she's on the phone. All right. So, all he, all Mark did is he said, "Okay, there's a red dot," and he just goes, "Oh, right there's a sell signal." He's placing those on the chart to, to showcase where the buy and sell is, but it doesn't put those on the chart for you. Um, uh, let's see. Thank you. Can you make a question about these? Gail, I'm, I'm, I, you'll, I, you'll be in my, my, my thoughts this weekend. I hope it works out for you. You might get lucky. I don't think the $97 package does that. No, there, um, no package puts the arrows on this thing. This right here deals with me, the human, placing this on the chart. So, yeah, just to showcase it, yeah. Did Apple guy ever recover his money? No, he still loses money. By the way, I just bought the core, and I'm looking to upgrade once I'm given a run. But I have committed to you guys. Awesome on, uh, awesome on the money. Literally, great job so far. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're here. All right, that's going to wrap it up for me. Any other stocks or symbols that you want me to take a look at? The proper traditional name for Easter is P. 
P-A-S-C-H-A. Okay, there's no way I can pronounce that. I bought these, very nice. Netflix, okay. N-F-L-X, Netflix. So on Netflix here, you've got a bounce, probably going to go to the purple, right? It's been a little depressed. So what you want to do is let it bounce a little bit. You did have a short signal today since it is a valid downtrend. There would be nothing wrong with shorting Netflix there and there. Just know that what you're looking for there is entries, but once it clears that yellow, it usually goes to the purple. So you might have to take a little bit of heat on these on these sell signals for just a little bit. Uh, QQQ. Uh, QQQ. QQQ is a, it's probably going to the purple, so $87. I would look for sell signals once it gets to $87. Nobody, nobody answers, and the machine says that it will get back to me in 24. The government is faster than that. Uh, RD, there are three operators right behind me right now. Do you hear the phone ringing off the hook on the background? I'm, I'm serious. There are three people right behind me answering the phone as fast as they possibly can. If you leave a message, I personally promise you they will get back to you. If you call, area code 859-963-3445. I mean, they're right behind me. I can turn around and say, hey, Susanna, how are you? Right. It's like Susanna's right now on the phone and just waiting at me. So, yes. <laughs> IPO like WP. You can't really do it with a – I wouldn't do it with an IPO like WP, Frank. I'd let it trade a bit because you need to let the thing kind of settle out a little bit. IBM is one I'd like to look at. Let's take a look at IBM. IBM. I do like IBM. A uh, pick up here at 190. You can see that it 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 had earnings and then it gapped down. But that picking it up at the purple makes sense to me. So today's uh, signal on the value chart said pick it up at the open. See it right there. It said pick it up at the open on a 10 minute chart. Not a bad little call. Earnings will always mess you up, but I like IBM picking it up at you know. Uh, 190 all the way down to 186. I still like it. They will. They called me back last night at 10:30 p.m. There you go, Eddie. Thank you very much. How long uh, will they be there answering the phone tonight? Uh, I have another webinar that I'm doing at 8 o'clock, which is in about 45 minutes. So they'll be here for the next couple of hours. So yeah. At US, I think I missed it. At US. Uh, at US is, I like it more on the short side than the long side because you've sold off through the yellow. It's probably going to go to the purple. And it might even hit 133. So it might be a decent sell on the smaller time frame. Okay, I'm still bullish on the bonds long term because they're, they're in a bullish uptrend, but they've topped out. Now they're going to do a little bit of selling off, come back down here to support, and then bounce back off of those. So, yeah. Uh, YE... Y-E-O-W? Okay, that one does not work for me. At ES, I think I already did at ES. At ES is a buy. It's above the yellow and the purple. And I would buy it, but there's no, I didn't see any buy signals today on the value chart. We probably have them on a five. If we go down to five minute, we'll get some buys on the, there you go. There's some five minute buy signals on the ES today. You had one right here. Here, I'll, I'll kind of highlight them for you. You had about two, three signals here. Let me see if I can corral these suckers up for you. So you had one there, and you had another set right here. So not too bad. You know, you had to take a little bit of heat, but not much, and it bounced pretty good for you. And then here at the end of the day, you also had, I'm just lowering the time frame so you can see what kind of signals it generates. I'm a, uh, I am a nuance, but VXX, please. VXX, I don't know if that symbol will work on trade session. Let's see. Yes, it looks good. So let's see what VXX is. VXX is a short, so you want to stay short. So on a, there's no five-minute signals today on that, but there were a couple of cells back in here. You see these little handful of red tips? So you would have shorted in this area. I haven't seen any other red tips to the high side other than this one back here. Hopefully that helps you out. What does GLD or silver look like? GLD is going to look just like just like gold, right? So gold's going to be um, obviously a, a little down because it's below the yellow, so it's going to want to go to 120, 
that gold's going to want to do GLD-123. So on a five-minute, you, you didn't have a cell signal today, but you had one here one, two, three days ago. You had a cell signal on GLD right there. That called the dead high on GLD. That works really well, specifically on a five-minute. I just changed it to a five so I could show you more signals. It also had some really good signals here, sell here and sell here. So, yeah. Uh, GE, GE's probably in a, GE just cleared the cloud, so you got to focus only on the upside right now. It cleared the cloud and the lagging line went up. That one's just be careful because it's really gappy. It's, in na it's, it's a little gappy in nature, so I'd be careful with that one. I could sell you both ways on that and be careful. All right, there's your link. Good luck. Hope it helps. I'm out of here. I'll see you on the next webinar. Have a great Easter and have a great weekend. I'll see you guys on the videos and on the next webinar.